Hi, I want to make a short video about energy production in the world um, and the consequences. So this graph shows you all the different countries in the world and how much energy they use on average per citizens. And up the, x x the y axis uh, it shows you uh, how much prosperity or uh, social progress there are in each of those countries. So you can see some of the countries that does best is the Scandinavian countries in Canada. Um, where uh, there's a high level of prosperity for the citizens. But you can also see at the same time that these countries use a lot of energy. Uh, when you look at the other end of the scale, you see uh, some of the countries that are not doing so well. And what you'll find is they use a lot of less energy. What I want to point out is this axis here is logarithmic. That means that um, if these countries, citizens from these countries want to move up to the prosperity level that these countries have over here, um, they would need maybe 10 times or um, 20 times more energy in order to reach up here. And so you can see that it's not enough just to make better education and better rule of law in those countries. What you need first and foremost is em enough energy to have a high prosperity level in that country. And then of course, once you have the energy, then it also helps if you have the right level of education and, and rule of law. Now. Uh, only approximately 1 billion people of the world's population is up here. The, there's approximately 5 billion people who, down here who would very much like to move up here. And I don't think anyone have anything against that. The only problem is we don't have enough energy in the world today to get these people moving up here uh, in a short amount of time. But let's look at that problem. So first of all, I want to look at... The, so this is an example of the energy you use from... A uh, a Danish country, this is my own country, um, and you can see here that this blue bar here is the amount of food that we consume every day. Um, and uh, the rest of it is because when we need to get that food, we spend a lot of energy for producing that food, transporting it, um, storing it in, in refri refrigerated environments and selling it, and then we also throw a lot of the food out before uh, we ever get to eat it. So approximately 10 times more energy is spent uh, to get the food to our mouth than what energy we get out of the food once it gets into the stomach. If we compare that to how much electricity we use in a country like ours and most OECD countries, we use approximately the same amount of electricity as we use energy in food production. Um, and here I've plotted the blue part uh, is the amount of electricity used in a in a typical home, and the rest of the energy is used in offices and factories and losses in the uh, electrical grid. But then you want to look also at all the energy used uh, per citizen, and this is um, so this is a Danish amount of energy used. Um, but actually, this doesn't account for the whole thing because. Um, we import a lot more products than we manufacture in the country and export, and that means that all the energy needed for production of those products are not accounted for here. So in reality, the bar would be even uh, longer, but it's difficult to find the right numbers for that. Uh, I've plotted here also in the amount of uh, wind energy we get in Denmark, which is approximately uh, 6 or 7% of the total energy supply. Um, so, of course, this is the amount of energy you need to survive. All the rest of this energy is just what you need to have a nice life. So, it's prosperity energy. And you would ask yourself, if we really do not have enough energy for everyone in this world, could we save some of this? And, of course, I mean, we could easily save some of this. We could throw a little less food away or we can optimize the way we transport it so that we'd spend less energy on the food production. Um, and I'm sure that there's many other places we could we could uh, fly less on vacations, we could be better at driving in efficient cars or even uh, drive in um, carpool so we have fewer cars and that would save a lot of energy. There are many things we could do to save energy. Um, but let's look at the total energy supply in the entire world. And more than 75% of that is comes from fossil fuels, while only less than 1% come from wind and solar. Now these numbers are a little bit old, um, but now it's still a little bit less than 1%, and this is still uh, more than 75%. Uh, you also see that nuclear is only 2.5%, and hydro is only uh, 3.8%. And uh, of course, the good thing about those two are it's uh, almost um, CO2-free. 
So let's go ahead and look at what could we do to produce a lot more energy. Because what we saw in the first graph is we would need at least five times more energy production in the world if we want to bring every person in the world uh, up to a prosperity level uh, similar to some of the best countries. Um, and of course that would take quite a number of years to do that. Uh, and also it's not enough just to have energy. We would also require education and rule of law and many other things. But until you have enough uh, energy, it's simply not possible to have a high level of prosperity in those countries. Um, so let's look at uh, the forecast for creating more energy. And you can see here that the growth uh, is, um, yeah, it's not a lot. In the next 20 years, um, it's not even a doubling. It, uh, it's not even, it's something like 25% uh, increase in energy. And most of that increase comes from oil and gas and coal. Um, renewable energies, which also include biofuels, only account for a small amount of the increase. And of course, we have to look at how can we change this? Potentially, we would like to change it so that it's, it's not diminishing over time, but it's continued to increase so that this graph, instead of bending a little bit downwards, it would bend upwards. I know it, it won't make a huge difference in the short term, but in the longer term, in the next 50 or 100 years, it will make a big change. So what we have to look for is how can we generate more energy here? And um, it's really difficult to do that from wind and solar. And if we do it from all the fossil fuels, we create CO2, which is also a problem. But maybe there's a solution down here because nuclear uh, creates very little amount of CO2 uh, emissions per uh, kilowatt hour electricity or energy produced and this is even old nuclear technology there are new nuclear technologies where this might be brought down to half or maybe even down to five um, per um, you know per kilowatt hour um, and then uh, there's this technology where you can convert uh, biomass into uh, synthetic fuels um, and if you have a very efficient power plants that run at high temperature, you can make this process very efficient. And it's highly likely that um, within a foreseeable future, we will be able to manufacture synthetic fuels that when you burn them, uh, they actually um, you know, produce less carbon because you, you take CO2 out of the atmosphere in order to convert these into liquid fuels like gasoline. And then once you burn it, you of course, you will release some of that CO2 again, but you release less CO2 than what was um, uh, sequestered when you wanted to create these fuels in the first place. So here's an opportunity. We need extra energy in order to do this conversion from biomass into, um, into synthetic fuels, but we can get that energy from nuclear power where it has very little uh, CO2 footprint. And then we will get into a situation that the more fuel we use around the world, the more CO2 we subtract from the atmosphere. So we kind of create a positive cycle where um, we can create energy for all the people in the world that doesn't have energy today um, and at the same time reduce the CO2 uh, levels in the atmosphere. Um, but of course, in order to do that, we would need to create a lot of nuclear um, uh, reactors. So basically, um, in order to start all those nuclear reactors. Let's go and look at this graph, because this graph shows you, um, for example, we are from Copenhagen Atomics. We have, we have a suggestion to build uh, 50 megawatt reactors, because we know that this can be scaled up fast. Um, and this is a simulation that says, let's assume we have 3,000 uh, tons of plutonium in the world, because we need plutonium to start these reactors. And then let's resume that they have a breeder ratio of, of 1.1. They won't have that in the very beginning, but quite soon when the when the amount of reactors we are manufacturing starts to rise, then we will, uh, well, at least in this simulation, we assume that we have a breeder ratio of 1.1. Um, and there's also other assumption here is how fast you can uh, scale up the production. Um, and once you run out of your plutonium, uh, you don't have enough startup fuel from so from there on you have to rely on the uh, breeder ratio to create more uranium 233 in order to scale up the energy production and this will take many years because this is like um, 
interest rate calculation and and the, so this is only 10% interest so it takes a lot of time um, before you um, kind of collect money in your bank account if you compare to that um, you can see here over here so 50 megawatt thermal is a small reactor so we would need lots and lots of reactors but it is this is like um, manufacturing cars uh, or airplanes on assembly lines and we manufacture many many more cars like, uh, than this every year so um, this can be done I mean it, it's a uh, what do you call that um, economically and um, uh, engineering wise it's possible to do this so we would scale up and have a total amount of reactors in the world of something like 50,000 reactors and then eventually it would scale up over uh, 87 years to reach 5 terawatt of energy production uh, of course 5 terawatt of energy production this is electric so it's almost uh, 10 terawatt of thermic uh, thermal power uh, but of course that's um, that's not uh, uh, it's something like 50 percent of the global energy production today but in 80 years from now of course the global energy production will also scale up so at that time it will be uh, less than half of the energy production but the, it it's still way better and it, it makes these um, it makes these graph uh, graph like this look a lot better they would definitely bend upwards um, and then it will bend up slowly in the beginning because it takes time to get it started but then after 30 50 years it will go up steeply and then we can really account on uh, account on getting more energy uh, for people around the world and at the same time we can help reduce the amount of um, CO2 in the atmosphere and finally we can use the dist uh, distribution system we already have in the world for distributing liquid fuels and liquid fuels are really good uh, as storage that's what, what we always talk about with wind and solar we need we need some storage solutions but um, they're not uh, you know anywhere near uh, in in terms of technology so what I'm what we're looking at here is we have 400 reactors around the world that has these pool with spent nuclear fuel that uh, politicians are some sometimes debating what we should do about it but it, what it turns out if we need all this fuel in order to start these many new reactors um, to build this uh, fossil fuel or to create this sorry not fossil fuel this th synthetic fuel and synthetic gasoline so basically what this turns into now it's a problem for the nuclear reactor companies but in the future this is the biggest gold mine they have this stuff here will be more expensive than gold or diamond in the very new future um, so every nuclear reactor around the world we have approximately 400 of those actually have a gold mine uh, sitting right next to their building so what is it we need to do? We need to take that uh, nuclear waste out and then we need to run a chemical separation process where we uh, separate the 95% that is uranium because we cannot use that. We, we can sell that back to the global uh, uranium market. It's a, basically a, a materials market. And then the rest of this is uh, fission products and actinides and plutonium. The plutonium is in this part. It's a lot of this, you know, um, 0 0.9 um, percent of this is plutonium and that's what we need to start all those waste burners the rest of it is fission products and uh, since they have been in this fuel pools for many years already they're not really very radioactive anymore but they're still radioactive enough that we want to st store them in a safe way and we already know how to do that uh, it's done by putting them into a matrix of molten glass and then store them inside a, a stainless steel container and then they can be stored for 300 years after that they have very small radioactivity levels and it shouldn't be a problem for for society at all um, this stuff over here is what is normally termed long-term uh, radioactivity in the waste products uh, but we can burn that one more time in those um, waste burners it first of all it helps to get the waste burner started like I showed in this graph uh, so this is what we use all the plutonium from it's to get these breeder reactors started once they are started they will create their own fuel from thorium um, but 
when we use this uh, plutonium to burn in here, it might need to burn for many, many years, something like 50 years. But eventually, it will fission all these um, uh, long-lived actinides and turn them into fission products that we later can ex extract through a chemical um, separation process, and then those fission products can also be stored and in a safe way for 300 years. So it's a way to break down the waste and um, reduce the amount of waste in the world. So how would you, how would we do this? Um, well, the goal is to start at least one of these breeders every day for Gold Copenhagen Atomics. But as you could see from the graph, that is not nearly enough. I mean, um, already in approximately 25 years from now, uh, we would have an energy production of something like uh, 1.2 terawatt. Um, and uh, this this is uh, mm, this is something like two three percent of the uh, global energy production. No, sorry, because this is uh, um, this is electrical energy, so it's more than that. It's uh, it's more like uh, five percent of the global energy production. Okay, so let's go back again to this one. Um, yeah, so in order to be able to scale this up, uh, the number one thing we need to do is these new reactors that we want to build, they must be able to manufacture on a production line. Otherwise, this whole story goes to uh, shit. <laughs> I mean, it's not possible to do what I'm suggesting here if we cannot manufacture these on a simpler line. The second thing is we need to have fast technology cycles. I can uh, I can show this over here because if we so this assumes that we can we can create um, better and better reactors over the over the years. But if we have very slow um, production and very slow doubling times, let's say something like 36 months, um, then you can see that it will take almost 200 years to reach uh, five terawatt. Um, it will be a much, much slower process if we're not able to have a rapid um, development in these pro uh, reactors. And what's really important here, uh, let me just bring this back to 18 months. What, uh, what is really important here is that we need to keep the amount of startup fuel very low. Let's assume that over the years we're able to improve this so much that we can get it down to 40 kilograms per, um, per reactor unit that we want to start up then it really improves the number of years uh, that uh, we have to wait until we can scale this up in a power level. Um, and also I think we will not be able to have a 1.1 breeder ratio from the very beginning. It will take s yeah, several generations of development in order to reach that level. Um, so we should expect some uh, R&D to go on. Therefore it's important to have rapid technology cycles. Again, otherwise this whole story um, will not work out. Um, and then, like I talked about, we have to solve the nuclear waste problem. I don't think we can uh, tell the global uh, population honestly that they should build these many, many nuclear reactors without at the same time solving the waste problem in a way that people uh, feel is good. And finally, um, n a new nuclear industry should not be founded on secrecy and um, secret deals. It should be founded on collaboration across countries and on openness. Um, and in Copenhagen Atomics we focus on chemistry, measurement technologies and control systems to help this um, new technology develop. Um, yes, in Copenhagen Atomics we have uh, proposed this a new type of reactor design. There's several n uh, new novel concepts in this and I will not go through this uh, um, except that saying that because we use heavy water and because we use this new method of removing the fission product from the salt uh, online, so it's kind of a, an online uh, removal of fission products without doing wet chemistry or complex chemistry, um, then we believe that we are able to um, achieve a much lower uh, loss of neutrons. Uh, if you compare different types of reactor systems, you can. Uh, I, first of all, I should say that we've had uh, um, m many difficulties finding uh, these numbers in the literature. 
Um, but so some of this is guesswork based on other numbers that we were able to find. So you should take this with um, a big caution. But it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. In old type of reactors called light water reactors, um, these are old designs that are based all the back from the 1940s. Uh, they have a very bad neutron economy and it's simply not possible to get them into a breeder ratio where they were will in any way produce the amount of energy that I, I talked about in that graph. Let me just go back and change the numbers. So those type of reactors, um, if you really improve them, it's not that design that I refer to there, but there are suggestions where you can improve it um, and maybe get to a breeder ratio of 1.1. There has been studies where they showed that this would be the the absolute maximum possible uh, you could get out of those types of reactors. But those reactors are not manufactured on assembly lines. They typically have something like uh, 50 month in, um, oops, let's say 36. Oh. Let's see here. So we say something like 30 months in doubling time and you would see that they have almost 700 years in order to produce the same amount of power that we would otherwise be able to produce in in 80 years. So this technology um, will not work if you want to really increase the amount of energy in the world. And at the same time light water reactors is not able to produce a high, you know, very high temperature steam and that means that this conversion process that I talked about where you can uh, convert um, biomass into uh, liquid fuels like syn synthetic gasoline will not be possible with these types of reactors. So therefore this is not a solution uh, in the long term for the world. But of course these reactors do create the plutonium that would be needed to start the new type of reactors. There's other reactors designed like the Kandu reactor uh, that has a uh, quite better neutron if, uh, economy, but it's still not good enough. What we're proposing from Copenhagen Atomics is this uh, heavy water moderated molten salt reactor. And um, studies so far show that it's likely that we can get the neutron economy down to this level. And if we can get it down there, then it would be possible to have a breeder ratio of this 1.1 that I mentioned before. Um, thank you.